This is the video for the third section of Kant's Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. I have good news and bad news. The bad news is that this section has a lot of really complicated stuff. The good news is that, as the reading quiz points out, most of the really complicated stuff you don't really need to understand, and then the tiny bit that you do need to understand I will explain in this lecture so uh, you should be fine with this section. So you can see the agenda for the lecture down here. We're going to cover four topics. So starting with the first topic, what is freedom? So this is the first thing that Kant talks about in this section. You'll find this familiar because, you know, what is freedom was also a big concern of the second section, which you just read uh, in the previous reading assignments. So we get freedom described again for Kant. So he says, the will is a species of causality of living things insofar as they are rational. And freedom would be that quality of this causality by which it can be effective independently of alien causes determining it. So. The will, which we've seen all over this book, basically the first sentence was I, the only good thing, the only purely good thing is a good will. And then we've had lots of explanations. What is the will? How does the will work? So the will, it's a species of causality of living beings. So it's a sort of a kind of causation or a kind of way of making things happen for living beings insofar as they are rational. So again, it's only rational beings who have will Rational beings control themselves through their will. Irrational beings, like animals, uh, or I guess non-human animals, they don't have a will. They just act on instinct or desire or something like that. They don't get to decide what they do. They don't get to control themselves. They're just controlled by their instinct. So insofar as a being is rational, so for rational beings, they have a will which causes them to do things. And freedom is that quality of this causality by which it can be effective independently of alien causes determining it. So the thought is, look, is your will free? Well, your will is free if it's not being determined by alien causes, by things sort of outside yourself. If other things are controlling your will, then you don't have a free will. If you are controlling your will, then you have a free will. So that's supposed to be pretty simple and straightforward, not very controversial. Your will is free if it's not controlled by sort of outside forces that are forcing you to do one thing or another. It's only free if you're deciding what you do. So just as natural necessity is the quality of causality of all things lacking reason, of being determined to activity through the influence of alien causes. So for things without reason, for instance non-human animals and then inanimate objects like a rock, these things are determined by natural necessity. And so what does Kant have in mind here? Well, uh, just natural laws like the law of gravity, for instance, determines how rocks move. Laws about photosynthesis determine how plants do things. Uh, you know, all sorts of laws determine how things go. Just anything that's not controlled by a will is controlled by just the laws of nature. So that's also pretty straightforward. Um, and as he puts it, that is being determined through to activity through the influence of alien causes. So none of these things control themselves. The rock doesn't control itself. The plant doesn't control itself. They're all completely controlled by the laws of nature. So the proposed definition of freedom is negative and hence unfruitful in affording insight into its essence. So what is freedom? Oh, it's not being controlled from things. But that's just like a negative definition that tells you what freedom is not. Freedom is not being controlled by stuff outside of you. But he, you know, that doesn't tell us what freedom is, really. It just tells us what it's not. So we have a negative definition of freedom, yet from it, from this negative definition, flows a positive concept of freedom, which is all the more rich in content and more fruitful. Great, so we can derive sort of more detail about freedom from this negative thing. Since the concept of causality carries with it that of laws in accordance with which it must be posited, with which, sorry, <laughs> this, this is a long sentence. Here we go. Since the concept of a causality carries with it that of laws in accordance with which must be posited through that which we will call a cause, something else, namely its result. So that's 
an unnecessarily complicated way of saying, look, how does causality work? How does causation work? How does cause and effect work? Well, via laws. So for instance, the law of gravity explains cause and effect when it comes to things falling. Um, and you know, all the laws of physics, not just the laws of gravity, but all the laws of physics explain cause and effect for, you know, objects moving around. So if you if one ball hits another ball and then the other ball rolls off, the laws of physics explain cause and effect there. So cause, one ball hits another, effect, it rolls off. So causation, causality works through laws, according to Kant. Laws explain causation and causality. And if this sounds familiar, good, because we've seen this already at least once, maybe twice or three times in this book. So he's repeating something he said before, causation works through laws. Therefore, freedom, even though it's not a quality of the will in accordance with natural laws, is not for this reason lawless. So he says, look, everything works according to laws, and freedom is causality. So remember, will is causality, and you can have a free will or not a free will. So a free will it still works due to cause and effect. It's not like we're independent from cause and effect. So things are still going to work through laws, so free will is going to function according to laws. Um, but not natural laws. So freedom isn't going to be uh, following the laws of physics or anything like that. It's a different kind of law for free will. Rather, it has to be causality in accordance with unchangeable laws, but of a particular kind, so special kind of laws. For otherwise, a free will would be an impossibility. So if there's no law determining how your will works, there could be no such thing as free will because there could be no cause and effect. So we don't want free will to just be random, like not determined by any sorts of laws. That wouldn't be free will. It just wouldn't work. There would be, nothing can happen for no reason. Nothing happens for no reason. Everything's caused by cause and effect by certain laws. So there's got to be a law for free will, just like there's a law for physical objects. Natural necessity was a heteronomy of efficient causes. For every effect was possible only in accordance with the law that something else determined the efficient cause to causality. So complicated again, but if you recall back to heteronomy, which is from the previous section, heteronomy is sort of being determined by something outside of yourself, outside of you. So all natural laws, so the laws of physics, that's all heteronomy. The rock when it falls or the ball when it gets pushed, that's not because of some sort of law inside of it. It's because of forces outside of it, laws outside of it, causes outside of it. So it's the gravity that's dragging the rock down, not something inside the rock. Um, it's the other ball pushing the ball that makes it move, not something inside the ball. Uh, everything is sort of in the natural world is heteronomy, determined by stuff outside of it. What else then could freedom of the will be except autonomy? That is the quality of the will of being a law to itself. So yeah, that makes sense. So if you think back up here, freedom of the will is being determined not by outside features, but by something inside you. And Kant says, well, if we get rid of out, all the outside features, which is heteronomy being determined by something outside, all that's left is being determined by something inside, by being the law inside, which is autonomy. And if you go back and look at the lecture for autonomy, that's from autonomos, self-law. So where is the law coming from if it's not outside you? Oh, it's coming from inside of you. So having a free will must be sort of giving yourself a law or determining yourself from a law inside of you. So makes sense so far. But the proposition, the will is in all actions a law to itself. So basically what we just realized free will is, or autonomy designates only the principle of acting in accordance with no other maxim than that which can also have itself as a universal law of its object. So if that sounds familiar, good. That's just what Kant has basically been saying the whole book, right? Remember in the previous section, we learned autonomy and morality are just the same thing. So morality is the categorical imperative, only act according to a maxim which you can will become a universal law. And that's also autonomy, Kant thinks, for the arguments we saw back in the second section or as he puts it, but this is just the formula of the categorical imperative and the principle of morality. Thus, a free will and a will under moral laws are the same. So free will is doing the right thing. 
is behaving according to the moral law. When you behave according to the moral law, you have autonomy. Autonomy is free will. So you have free will when you're behaving morally. And if you think about the converse, when you're not doing the right thing, when you're not behaving according to the moral law, you don't have free will. And in fact, what does it look like when you're not behaving according to the moral law? Well, usually you're following your desires. You're just doing what you want to do. You're not doing the right thing. And what is following your desires? Well, it's not autonomy, it's heteronomy. It's being determined by something outside of you, namely not your will, but your desires. So your will isn't free if your desires are deciding what happens. Your will is only free if it's deciding what happens. So Kant says you can be free and moral, or you can be unfree and immoral. So hopefully that kind of all makes sense, but then if you stop to think about it, that is kind of weird. So hold on, freedom is doing what morality tells me to do, and then lack of freedom is doing whatever my desires tell me to do? That sounds backwards. The way I thought about this before I read Kant was, freedom is just doing whatever I desire to do. And then a lack of freedom is having to do whatever morality tells me to do. I have to do the right thing. So maybe sometimes I should have limits on my freedom and I should have to follow morality. But, you know, if I had complete freedom, I'd just follow my desires. And here Kant is, he's literally saying the opposite of that. He says following your desires is heteronomy, it's unfreedom. Following morality, the moral law, is autonomy, it's freedom. So it all kind of makes sense the way he's developing things. So like this all makes sense and this all, make, all of this makes sense in light of the stuff earlier in the book. But this is kind of like a really weird and strange and interesting picture of human action and human free will and stuff. So you want to think to yourself, how plausible do I find Kant's picture here? Like is freedom really doing the right thing and lack of freedom is just following my desires and stuff like that? Is that how it works? But that's something really interesting about Kant. And so that covers point number one, what is freedom? Point number two, why we have to regard ourselves as free. So, uh, let's see. Why ought I to subject myself to this principle, and specifically as a rational being in general, hence through this also all the other beings endowed with reason? So why do I have to do this stuff? Why do I have to be like autonomous? Why do I have to be free? Why do I have to be moral? Why can't I be heteronomous? Why can't I just do whatever my desires tell me to do? Why can't I behave sort of like an unthinking animal and act on instinct and uh, just do whatever gets me the most pleasure? Why do I have to be like a good person, effectively. So he says, look, I will concede that no interest drives me to it, for that would yield no categorical imperative. So he's going to say, look, let's just say you have no desire to be moral. Now, Kant doesn't literally think nobody ever wants to be moral, but to sort of make the argument as strong as possible, or to make the case against him as strong as possible, he says, look, let's just, let's imagine, let's concede that you have no interest in being moral. And anyways, it wouldn't even help if you had an interest in being moral because um, as we've seen earlier in the book, morality is about doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do, not because you feel like you have to, or not because you sort of desire to do the right thing. So it's like great if you desire to do the right thing, but that doesn't make you morally good. What makes you morally good is doing it because it's the right thing, not because it's your desire. So really it doesn't matter whether you have an interest in being moral or a desire in being moral. So let's just assume you don't have one. But I must necessarily take an interest in it. So you necessarily have to sort of uh, have an interest in being moral and gain insight into how that happens to be. So, you know, think about what morality is and how it works. For this ought, the ought of morality, so the categorical imperative, is really a volition that would be valid for every rational being under the conditions that reason were practical in him without any hindrances. So morality, as we've seen, is sort of what you ought to do. And if there weren't any hindrances, if you had no contrary desires or anything, as a rational creature, you would always be moral. So it's only 
the sort of facts of being human that get in our way. If we were perfect rational creatures, we would always be moral. And we realize this, Kant thinks, when we reflect on rationality and morality. For beings such as we, who are also affected through sensibility, as with incentives of another kind, so we have all these, he calls it sensibility, so this is where all our desires and stuff come from. We're affected with this in addition to rationality. We're not pure rational creatures, we're rational plus sensible creatures. With whom uh, what reason for itself alone would always do does not always happen. So again, we don't always act according to rationality. That necessity of action is called only an ought, and the subjective necessity is different from the objective. And so uh, what does this have to do with why should I, why do I have to regard myself as free? Why do I have to be moral? So it's actually back here. I must necessarily take an interest in it because this is valid for every rational being. And so what is he saying here? He's saying, look, you are a rational being. That's what humans are. You're not a perfectly rational being. Remember, you're also affected uh, through sensibility. So you have non-rational parts of you, and those sometimes determine what you do. But you are a rational being. And we've discovered that the categorical imperative applies to every rational being equally, insofar as they're rational. So the thought is, why do you have to regard yourself as free? Well, freedom is equivalent to morality. We've just seen that. Morality is equivalent to rationality. Morality is the categorical imperative, which applies to all rational creatures insofar as they're rational. So basically, the categorical imperative already applies to you because you're a rational being. It's not really a question of am I free or am I not free. Insofar as you're rational, you are free. It's too late. Now, of course, you're not only free. You're not only rational. You have this irrational part. You're a human. You're imperfect. So you're not always going to do the right thing. But insofar as you're rational, you are going to do the right thing. Whenever you act according to reason, you're going to do the right thing. And sometimes you're going to act according to reason. You are a rational creature. You do sometimes control yourself. So the thought is, why do you have to regard yourself as free? Well, it's, it's too late. You are free. You are a rational creature. You have freedom. You have autonomy because this is the sort of thing you are. So there's not even a question, should I be moral? You already are, like morality already applies to you. It's just a question, can you sort of overcome your desires and do what applies to you? Or do you let your desires take over? So that's another really interesting move Kant makes. So if we think about Aristotle's answer to why should I be good, why should I do morality, like why should I be a good person? For Aristotle, that's a weird question because morality is about eudaimonia, about being a good person. And asking why you should be a good person is kind of silly. Like goodness is just the thing that everybody aims at. Eudaimonia is the chief end. So it would be silly to ask why should I get that? That's the reason you do anything. So just by definition, goodness is what you want to achieve. So why should you be a virtuous person? Well, because virtue is part of eudaimonia, and eudaimonia is the thing that everybody seeks. So for Aristotle, it's not really a question like, why should I be a good person? Like, of course you want to be a good person. That's what it is to uh, succeed as a human. For Kant, we have a very different answer. Why should you be a good person? Well, it's kind of too late. Morality already applies to you because you're rational. Being rational is being good, and you can't not be rational. Of course, sometimes you are irrational, but, you know, insofar as you're thinking about what you should do, insofar as you're asking, give me a reason to be moral, then it's too late because you're already a rational person. And so rationality already requires morality. So those are two sort of interesting questions to why should I be moral? They sort of stack up against each other. And you, we can think about that kind of question going forward in the course. So now we know what is freedom, we know why we have to be free. Step three, how can we regard ourselves as free? So we have to regard ourselves as free, but how? How do I do that? How is it possible to think of myself as free? What if I don't think I'm free? What if I think this is not capable? I'm not capable of it. So how is a categorical imperative possible, as Kant puts it? Because remember, being free is just another way of saying uh, I'm following the categorical imperative. So how is this possible? 
The rational being counts himself as intelligence in the world of understanding, and merely as an efficient cause belonging to this world does it call its causality a will. So what we have here is um, it's coming from Kant's metaphysics. So in Kant's metaphysics, we have the world of understanding and the world of sensation, or the world of ideas and the world of appearances. So the thought is there's the, or the technical terms are the world of noumena and the world of phenomena. So phenomena is a word that exists in English now. It's like stuff, appearances, like things that we see. So the world of phenomena is everything you see around you. It's all the objects and all the things and blah, blah, blah. So that's the world of phenomena. And Kant thinks metaphysically, that's not all there is. There's also the world of sort of noumena, the sort of, uh, it's a world that we have no access to. You can't sort of perceive the world of noumena. You can think about it, but you can never sort of conclude anything uh, conclusive about it, or there's very little you can cl conclude conclusively about it. And so the world of understanding is kind of this mysterious realm out there, which we can make assumptions about, but we can never sort of prove anything. And then we have the world of noumena, which we can prove all sorts of things. So science can prove all sorts of stuff about the world. It can prove gravity and blah, blah, blah. So he says, you count yourself as intelligence in the world of understanding and merely as efficient cause belonging to this world. Does it cause its causality a will? So the thought is, well, everything exists sort of in these two worlds, or another way of thinking about it is these are two ways of looking at everything. You can look at it as uh, we experience it, or you can look at it as it truly is. Um, and we can't sort of ever directly look at anything as it truly is. We're an intelligence in the world of understanding. So, okay, insofar as we exist in the world of understanding, we're like a thinking sort of thing. And merely as an efficient cause, do we call our causality a will? So if you think about what is the will, one of the things the will is, is it's how we control ourselves. It's how we make ourselves move around effectively. So I use my will to control my hand. If I want my hand to close, I will that it closes and it closes. If I want my uh, eyes to close, I will that they close and they close. You know, I can use my will to control stuff. And specifically, I cause my hand to close. I cause my body to move in certain ways. So that's sort of... Uh, Kant calls that an efficient cause. This actually comes from Aristotle, uh, not what we read, but other stuff. Um, and so basically our will sort of is a thing in the world which causes stuff to happen. So that seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, we use our will to control our bodies. Great. From the other side, however, it is conscious of itself also as a piece of the world of sense, which is in, it, in which its actions as mere appearances of that causality are encountered but whose possibility for, oh boy, this is long. Um, so the basic thought is uh, we cause ourselves to do things and we can look at this from the point of view of the understanding, which is sort of, I don't know, our intelligence is doing something, or from the point of view of the world of sense or the world of appearances, which is um, seeing ourselves basically as machines really. Uh, our brain does something and this causes our hand to rise or fall or something. So those are two ways of looking at yourself as a sort of intelligence which is not bound by physical laws and as something like a squishy machine which is bound by physical laws. So those are sort of two ways of looking at yourself and they both kind of explain how you make your hand move. They're just different kinds of explanations. As a mere member of the world of understanding, so the world of sense, or sorry, uh, not the world of sense, the, the world of noumena, all of my actions would be perfectly in accord with the principle of the autonomy of the pure will. So imagine we didn't exist in this world with our bodies and stuff. Imagine we were just in the world of ideas. Then we'd be perfectly rational. There would be nothing sort of stopping us from being fully autonomous, from always doing the moral thing. But as a mere piece of the sensible world, as the phenomenal world, they would have to be taken entirely in accord with the natural law of desires and inclinations, hence with heteronomy of nature. So if you think about how scientists explain what we do, why I close my fist and stuff, scientists never talk about free will or like autonomy or anything. 
Scientists talk about desires and inclinations. So if you ask a psychologist or you ask a cognitive scientist why I want to close my fist, it's not going to be quite this simple. But like the basic picture is like, oh, I have some sort of like the chemicals in my brain are such that I most desire that I close my fist and this issues a nervous impulse from my brain down through the spinal cord up through my arm. and blah. So all this stuff Kant thinks uh, the way science explains the natural world the, and the natural laws and the laws of how the human works, those are all heteronomy, laws of nature. The former, he says, that all the sensible stuff rests on the supreme principle of morality, the second on that of happiness. So the thought is, how do we explain ourselves sort of as intelligences in the metaphysical realm? Uh, you know, as we have pure free will and we always do what's most rational. How do we explain ourselves in the actual world? Uh, he thinks happiness explains everything we do. So we do everything because we're sort of seeking happiness. Like that, you know, basically we want to achieve whatever makes us happy. So that's the thought. We have these two ways of looking at ourselves, which seem pretty incompatible. One is that we have free will and we're perfectly autonomous and we exist in the realm of understanding. And one in the realm of sense, we're just sort of controlled by happiness. We're just happiness machines. We do whatever makes us happy. But because the world of understanding contains the ground of the world of sense, hence also of its laws, hence is immediately legislative in regard to my will, which belongs wholly to the world of understanding, and hence, there's a lot of henses, <laughs> and hence must also be thought of wholly as such. Therefore, as intelligence, I will cognize myself, though on the other side, as a being belonging to the world of sense, as nevertheless subject to the laws of the first, that is, to reason, which in the idea of freedom contains the law of the understandings. Well, well, we'll stop reading here. So the way Kant thinks all knowledge works is that all this stuff in the world of understanding is the ground of the world of sense and of the laws of the world of sense. So everything we see in the world, not just us, but like all the laws of nature and the laws of nature govern everything in the world. All of that is grounded on certain principles in the world of understanding, certain metaphysical principles. What are those principles? You know, it's a long story, it's complicated, but the basic idea, it makes a lot of sense. So scientists, for instance, rely on notions like cause and effect, or substance, or identity, sort of very, very basic metaphysical notions. So uh, cause and effect, for instance, science, at least as Kant conceives of it, is not going to work very well without cause and effect. But cause and effect is not something we sort of observe in the actual world. Like you can't actually see a cause, or you can't actually see an effect. You can see something which we label a cause and which we label an effect, but you'll never see like the principle of cause and effect in the natural world. The principle of cause and effect, we have to assume, is in the world of understanding. It's a metaphysical truth. Can we actually access it? No, we can't actually like directly get our hands on it. But we have to assume there's such thing as cause and effect for science to work. So that's what Kant means when he says the world of understanding con contains the ground of the world of sense. What he means is, in order to make sense of all the stuff we see in the like the world of appearances, we have to assume that it's grounded in certain principles in the world of understanding. What that means for us and for freedom is he thinks the only way to understand yourself in this world as you appear to yourself is to assume in the world of understanding that you are a free will. He thinks that's the only way to make sense of yourself. So that picture I described earlier of how science describes things, Oh, like I just had, there's chemicals firing on in my brain and they cause me to move my hand. Kant thinks you cannot understand yourself entirely like that. That cannot be the only way you think of yourself. It just, no human functions like this. Every human feels like they're in control of their selves. You ask me, why did you close your hand? I don't say because some chemicals in my brain made me do it. I say because I'm, I decided to close my hand. So the only way to conceive of your, well, not the only way, but you must always conceive of yourself as being in control of yourself, or as Kant puts it, as being free, as being autonomous. You just, it just doesn't work for humans to see themselves as not having free will. We just experience ourselves as having free will. Can we ever prove it? No, because that's a sort of metaphysical principle off in the world of understanding. But you just, 
you cannot completely think of yourself only as a machine controlled by your brain. You think of yourself as controlling yourself, through your brain, of course, but as controlling yourself with your free will. That's how humans conceive of themselves. That at least is what Kant thinks. And so this aspect, considering ourselves as free, this is the ground of our sort of self-conception in the world of sense. So you have to think of yourself as free, as in control of yourself. There's just no other way to exist as a human being. So that answers how can we regard ourselves as free. Basically, you don't have an option. That's just that's how human beings work. And that answers the fourth question, how are categorical imperatives possible? Why? Well, because you're stuck with them. You have to regard yourself as free. And as we saw earlier, being free is being autonomous, is being moral. So you have to regard yourself as being a moral creature, subject to the moral law. Or as he puts it, and thus categorical imperatives are possible through the fact that the idea of freedom makes me into a member of an intelligible world, through which if I were that alone, all my actions would always be in accord with the autonomy of will. So the thought is, look, I must have a free will, and so I must be the sort of thing to which the categorical imperative applies. And in fact, if I were only that thing, then I'd always follow the categorical imperative. But since I intuit myself at the same time as a member of the world of sense, they ought to be in accord with it, in accord with the categorical imperative. And so the thought is, well, it turns out we're also like creatures in this world, in this world of appearances. And so really we can't say I am free. The best we can say is that I ought to be free. I ought to follow the categorical imperative. Like I'm rational, so I, I ought to do these things. I'm not always gonna, I'm not always gonna be perfect, but I ought to do these things. So that's some complex metaphysics. The basic picture is that the world of understanding is the ground of the world of sense. So it explains the world of sense. We have to assume certain things about the world of understanding like cause and effect. One of the things we have to assume is freedom. And once we assume freedom, and once we assume that we're free, this means the categorical imperative applies to us.